Defence and Security Analysis Division at DSTL, uh, which is the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my background, uh, what we do at DSTL, um, and also in particular what we do in my team, um, which is force structure analysis. So about me, uh, in 2012 I actually started a chemistry degree. Um, and then I joined the University of Birmingham Air Squadron, um, which gave me a really good insight into the careers available in the military um, and what life is like in the Air Force. Um, from there, I started a summer placement at DSTL, um, where I worked in capability analysis and benefit of investment. So looking at sort of high level problems and, and saying, uh, should you, you know, um, whether something is sort of worthwhile um, as a, to have as a capability. Then last year, I finished my chemistry degree um, and then almost straight away, I joined DSTL um, as a graduate working in cyber and C4ISR. Um, so C4ISR is command control, communications, uh, computers, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance. So uh, DSTL loves its acronyms. So if you uh, come and work with us, um, that's one of the highlights. Um, and then this year, um, in August, I moved into force structure analysis. So I still do some of the work I did before, um, particularly on intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance. Um, but now um, we're looking much more at the cost of these different um, things rather than their capabilities as such. So what's DSTL's role? Um, DSTL is part of the, the Ministry of Defence. We're a trading fund and an executive agency. So. Um, all our work is done on contract to the, uh, to the Ministry of Defence and we recover our full economic costs there. Um, we employ a large number of analysts and uh, scientists and engineers um, and we provide sensitive and specialist science um, and technology services for the Ministry of Defence and also across wider government. So people work also for, say, Department for Transport, the Home Office um, and anywhere else where they need our advice, really. Um, and we're responsible for delivering MOD's um, science and technology program, and we have really good links with industry um, and also academia. So we have uh, PhD projects that um, are funded by us, that are carried out in academia, um, that can be sort of looking at op operational research or more in the chemical sciences, um, and the opportunities are really sort of endless for that. Um, we also support military cooperation. So we have embedded military advisors and they sort of, for us analysts and scientists who don't really know that much about the military, they provide a dose of realism for us um, and they're able to, to give us their advice based on their own frontline experiences, um, which is really useful. Um, and we also work wider than just, uh, just the UK. We have lots of allies across NATO um, who we sort of have send analysts out on secondment. So there is opportunities for international travel um, there as well. But most importantly, we're there to champion science and technology skills across the MOD. Um, and that includes managing the careers of Ministry of Defence scientists. So our disciplines, vast is sort of, um, you can come from pretty much any background and find a place for yourself at DSTL, um, which is really fantastic, which means there are loads of opportunities available to you as an analyst or as a chemist. Um, and it sort of gives you an idea of the breadth of the work that we're able to undertake. Um, and this leads into our sort of key capabilities that we've sort of set out. Um, and these are the capabilities identified um, by sort of our executive um, that will help deliver um, defence, science and technology policy. Um, so I will only really mention uh, sort of analysis uh, here. And if you have any other questions about sort of other capabilities, then you can come and find us um, at, the, at the stand. Um, but sort of analysis, we, we use scientific methods um, to solve complex policy, organisational, operational problems. Um, and we help customers make informed decisions and we help them become sort of intelligence customers so that they really understand um, sort of how analysis and how, how a really robust bank of evidence can help them make their decisions. Um, and all our other capabilities, we all link together. Um, and so... You know, you could find you won't be limited to just working in one area, say. 
Um, and we have sort of many more projects, sort of particularly in the chemical, biological, radiological side, um, which are sort of lab based for scientists. Um, but sort of, you know, taking human capability as an example, um, that might be looking at how we can develop better clothes for soldiers to wear, how we can support um, and, and maximise the output of our people. Um, so it's, it's really vast. Right, our core sites. So, as you can see, we're based mostly down in the south. Um, our largest site is Porton Down, uh, and also featured on a BBC uh, Four documentary. Um, and that's where most of our scientists um, and sort of lab-based scientists are based. Um, and that's near Salisbury, um, for anyone. And then most of our operational analysts and um, sort of researchers are based at Ports Down West. And that's just outside Portsmouth. So most of our, our new graduates and also our placement students uh, actually live in Portsmouth. And most of the analysts sort of, uh, sort of live in the surrounding areas. We also have a site in Alverstoke, um, which is very small. And we're sort of uh, co-located there with the Institute of Naval Medicine. Um, and that's just on the other side of Portsmouth in, in Gosport. Our final site is Fort Halstead, um, and that's in Seven Oaks. Um, but that site, most people there will be moving towards Port and Down um, and Ports Down West in the, in the future. But we're not just based in the lab or the offices. We're based across the UK. We have analysts embedded with different uh, frontline commands with the Army, Navy, the Air Force. They're, they're based with them. They provide advice on a day-to-day -day basis at the front line. We have analysts based in um, the Ministry of Defence in Main Building in central London, um, or quite often on secondments. So they come back, they've learnt stuff from being um, with the sort of decision makers, and they bring that back down, and we can all learn from that and um, sort of cycle people through that. We also have people um, base, who support operations. So when um, we had the Ebola crisis, our analysts were able to provide um, advice on, on how the UK should, should sort of um, look to move people if, um, and support the sort of deployment of, of British soldiers um, in, 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 in Sierra Leone. Um, so we also have people who go out and work across NATO. Um, I have friends who've just come back from the States uh, working on projects um, and people can find themselves on you could be away for a couple of days or you could be on a secondment for a couple of years. Um, and someone from my own team um, has recently come back from working in the Pentagon in the United States. So um, the opportunities are vast. And likewise, we take analysts from uh, different countries. So we've most recently had someone from Australia um, and they come from sort of the reciprocal organisations of DSTL. So that, so that really broadens what we're, we're able to achieve and also sort of increases our sort of outlook as well. So in total, there are about 5,000 uh, analysts, um, scientists and engineers, but this also includes our contractors and military advisors in that figure. So now I'm going to talk more about force structure analysis and why it's really important that we even have this capability. So every year, the MOD has a budget of around 34 billion. Um, but in the next decade, we plan to spend more than 175 billion on new equipment. So we need to know how best to spend this. Um, and we require a robust evidence base to support the decisions um, on the future of our armed forces. So what do we look at? We look at how many ships, tanks, aircraft might we need? It's not just limited to those three things. Those are just examples. Um, but how best should we spend this money? Um, what variant of a particular ship might you want to buy? Uh, how many of them? So, so this sort of sums up our balance of investment process. How do you deliver your objectives um, with using a cost-effective um, and robust force? So... Our over-analysis approach in my team is that we take defence policy, such as the Strategic Defence and Security Review, um, which is released every five years, um, and then we have de develop a set of illustrative scenarios um, that are not contingency uh, plans for operations um, and are designed for us to be able to test future capabilities of a potential force. From this, we carry out wargaming and simulation. Our wargaming, um, we bring in military planners and we'll go through a scenario 
and we'll discuss it and, and look at how you can achieve that. So that could be um, sort of, it's not just about sort of war fighting, it will be looking at uh, how do we provide humanitarian aid um, and assistance across the world. And simulation allows us to explore multiple different courses of action rather than just focusing on one action, um, one course where you, you might only get uh, sort of a limited view. And from this, we use concurrency mod modelling. And our concurrency modelling links back to our defence policy, because defence policy sets out the number and the types of operations we want to be carrying out. Um, so we look at how robust are our forces to be able to carry out all these, um, these concurrent operations at different scales and spread out across the world. So then we're able to support procurement decisions, um, which isn't something we do uh, on a sort of day-to-day -day basis, that's sort of ad hoc, as it were. Um, and also, but our main focus is, is balance of investment. And techniques that we use there are sort of linear programming um, to optimise our force structures and also to work out uh, which are most cost effective. And then this all feeds back into defence policy um, and sort of hopefully is taken into account by decision makers to, um, to, to bring about the next sort of iteration of policy. Um, and then we go about it all over again. So this is one of the models we use. It's direct. It's, um, it's called direct, and it's to look at dynamic readiness and concurrency tool. Uh, and again, it's another acronym that we, we love. Um, but what we do in direct is that we set a, um, generate an example set of future histories. So future histories would be those scenarios that I just talked about, but spread over, say, 20, 30 years. Um, and we, we use a stochastic process to generate those. And we'll do it multiple, multiple times. Um, and again, these are not contingencies. Um, we then assign our force elements. So our force elements are our tanks, our ships, our people, um, which then can meet these demands on, the, on place on them in the scenario. Um, and then sort of our input data, we've got quite a few different categories here. So we've got our demand categories. Um, which, so within that, we would have, say, our forces that we have to commit permanently. So you will always require, say, people to guard the palace might be something that you have to consider in your demand category. You might also then consider that you might have a small operation, for instance, where you send um, a group of engineers to go and help a place that's had an earthquake, um, as we did quite recently in Nepal. Um, and then we look at how, uh, sort of how likely is an event to occur um, and what sort of, what's the probability associated with that. And to do that, we can, either, we can either determine that ourselves based on policy or we can actually look at historical operations and we have a huge historical, um, a huge bank of historical data which we're able to, to say, this is what we've done in the past, so we might do this again in the future. Then we apply our policy constraints, um, which all comes out of, of sort of um, the sort of high level decision makers. And this will cap our frequency, how many times you can be deployed, or how many times um, you, you have a certain scale of scenario occur, um, how long it takes to recuperate. So recuperation encompasses leave for um, our, our soldiers, uh, airmen and sailors, but also incorporates training, uh, time it takes to fix uh, ships or to fix equipment. Um, so recuperation is, is often quite a long time. Um, and then we also have our concurrency as our final policy constraint um, that's usually set. Um, and this sets the maximum number of, of operations. And then finally, we put in our, our various scenarios that we've generated previously. So what does it look like? Well, in our first uh, pit down at the bottom, we have our operationally ready forces. And in this case, we have two ships, two planes, and three tanks. Not a great armed forces. But then we have our first scenario. Uh, and this scenario lasts from January to sort of the end of um, March or early April. And this requires a ship and two tanks. And our operationally ready forces can then go and meet that demand um, and, and carry out that scenario. 
Once that scenario ends, our ship and two tanks then move into our recuperating pool, uh, where it will take them some time to then return to being operationally ready. But in the meantime, we have a second scenario which starts in July. This requires two tanks and a ship. However, we only have one tank and one ship. So what does this tell us? Well, we can say we do actually have a tank available, but it's not, it's not currently available. So how do you, you have to think about um, how you could mitigate that? Would you change how long you've got to recuperate your force? So we've got a sort of a recuperation <coughs> shortfall as opposed to actually having a shortfall in not having enough platforms. Um, and then those elements also move into being recuperating. And finally, our third scenario requires four fast jets. But again, we only have two fast jets and we have a shortfall then of, of two fast jets. And that means we actually have a stock shortfall. So we'd have to consider there, would you want to procure more ships? Uh, not ships, sorry, fast jets. Or could you achieve the same effect using a combination of different platforms that might then be ready? The outputs of this, so we have at the top, we have our sort of our um, demand outputs. So that tells us um, the sort of the number of future histories and when they occur. Um, so at the top, we've got enduring operations, which um, will last a considerable time period. Um, and underneath that, um, sort of larger and smaller um, interventions, for instance. Um, and then at the bottom here, we have the, the demand for a particular asset. So that, this could be your demand for, um, for a fast jet. So where we have the blue line, that just tells us that we can meet that demand. Um, and that, but however, when it, we have the, the red part, um, that tells us we've actually got a shortfall and we'd have to meet it using a, a different, um, using a different capability or we might have to accept that there's some risk. Um, so we do a lot of thinking about balancing risk with um, having as many uh, fast jets, ships, tanks as you would like. So what problems do we investigate? Um, well, we can investigate the size and the shape of the armed forces and how robust they are um, to, to different levels of operational demand. And we can change the policy, uh, we can change the level of concurrency, and we can also um, sort, of sort of assess the risk with that. Um, and we can also change our readiness profiles, which allows us to sort of, um, if we keep our forces at a high readiness, then we can meet more operations, but that also will cost more because you have to keep all of your uh, equipment, say, at a, at a higher level. Um, and then within our team, the sort of high impact work that we carry out um, and that we get involved in is, is really sort of mostly is based around the strategic defense and security review. Um, and quite often you'll get a phone call and someone will say, oh, we've got this policy and we'd like to know, can we, can we do it? Can we afford it? Um, and we do quite a lot of quick turnaround work in, in that regard. Um, and also we try and work out how much of everything is actually needed. Um, we also support strategic force development, which is more looking at what the size and the shape of our armed forces are gonna be, rather than just the policy associated with that. Um, and also we take part in a lot of international research collaboration um, with NATO, um, with our sort of key strategic partners, such as the United States, um, Australia, Canada. Um, <coughs> And so that's, that's a really key part of what we do at DSTL. Um, so I thought I'd finish on some of the benefits of working for DSTL um, and also um, some of the sort of experiences that you can have, especially as a new starter. Um, we have lots of um, sort of different trials that you can get involved in. Um, we have conferences, accreditation, um, and there are always people at DSTL who are ready to support you and to help you move on with your career, um, rather than uh, just sort of, it's, sort of, it's very sort of much about training and learning, um, which is probably one of the biggest benefits of, of working uh, with us. So yeah, any questions, I guess?